All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Speculative Work. I'm James Aaron. I'm a science fiction writer, and this podcast is an author diary of my work, goals, fumbles, and lessons. So hopefully you don't make the same mistakes I did or that I do. Here we are at episode nine. Um, I'm recording this on January 27th, 2019. I'm very excited to be at episode nine. One of the things I noticed listening to some of the previous episodes is I feel like I'm not being as energetic as I would usually be when I'm talking to anybody, especially about writing. And that's out of an attempt to not talk too fast and slur my words because that's something I do when I get really excited about a topic. Um, and it's funny because I was listening to you know the past episodes and the word speculative um, kind of slows me down when I first begin. So it's a, that's a challenging word, but it, you know, the whole, the whole idea of speculative work is kind of a play on spec work, which, you know, in the field of screenwriting is something that you would never want to do because it means you're doing work without uh, promise of getting paid up front. Um, so I thought it was a fun play on speculative fiction, which is, you know, most of what I write um, and the work it takes to get it done. So anyway, I will do my best to be as upbeat and energetic as I can, even though it's, it's late, uh, baby just got to sleep, and um, yeah, that's the time I have to do this thing uh, currently. So rock on. I'm recording this on January 27th, 2019, like I said. This week, I've got a few follow-up thoughts on the dinosaur author concept that I talked about uh, in the last show. And then I thought I would talk about something related to that same topic, uh, which is ties into the fact that, you know, we're in this state of transition in publishing, in readership, in how people receive stories, all those things, which is kind of what I was alluding to um, last week as well. So I thought I would talk about indie versus trad for science fiction authors. And this is something I think about a lot because I have friends on both sides of the fence and I'm currently in this interesting place where um, I have a publisher who is an indie author um, who does very well in his own right and so I'm in this weird new model um, that's exciting but it's also not part of the old model which is what I had been devoting a lot of time trying to be successful in so um, I consciously you know made the leap to this other side and I've been really, really happy that I did that. And I've learned a ton, but I'm in a place now where it's kind of, it's possible to see the benefits of both sides. So I wanted to talk a bit about that. And I think we're also in this really interesting place where we don't quite know what's going to happen with the industry concerning, you know, indie publishing versus traditional publishing and, and what that is going to be even five or 10 years from now. Then the other question I think about a lot is what is the state of the field? You know, and we, and we think of the field in science fiction, um, you know, you consider science fiction this sort of ongoing story that began with, you know, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or even Dracula or even further back than that when speculative fiction first began, you know, we first started saying, telling fantasy stories And then that evolved into science fiction and, you know, we went through the golden age in the 30s, 40s and 50s. And then that transitioned into 60s science fiction, you know, the new wave and then 80s, um, 90s and and where we are today. As if it's this ongoing conversation where stories are referring back to other stories and people are, you know, if they read widely in the quote unquote field, um, every new book that comes out is adding to that body of work. And so I kind of, you know, there's some, I've heard a lot of interesting things and I've observed a lot of interesting things with writers, um, especially on the indie side, that really is interesting to me. And so I wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, So yeah, which track you should pursue, you know, depending on what your goals are. And does it even matter anymore? You know, if if you were starting out right now, if I was talking to myself back in 2014, um, you know, would I tell myself to do something different? So I'm here to bloviate on all of that, but first let's do some updates. So work complete uh, for this week. I wrote 12,639 words, um, which is pretty exciting. I had a couple low days where I only wrote about 1,100 words, um, but overall I had a a pretty good average. I'm still sticking at the 1,700 words a day average, which uh, continuing these writing streaks um, is just really gratifying. You know, it's 
like I said before, if I can write multiple times during the day, it's much easier. And even tonight, for instance, I have, you know, kind of multiple creative things to do now that the baby is in bed. Um, so I need to knock out this podcast. And then after that, I will actually do my writing. So um, the good news is that I'm at a place in the book where the writing comes really easy. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to bang my head against a brick wall to figure out what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. And it's just a matter now of getting, you know, getting the words out. So that's an easy place to be. And it's pretty easy to hit, you know, 2,000, 3,000 words when I know that's the case. Because on previous projects, when I hit this point, like I've probably procrastinated or haven't written consistently. So I would need to do some, you know, 6,000 word days to make up my, my writing plan. And I'm not in that position right now, which feels good. I've got a, a week to go before I need to hand the book off to Michael. And I'm going to be in a really good place as far as picking up the little side stories that I need to do. And I will have a manuscript that's you know pretty much done. Um, there's, there isn't going to have to be any handing it off and then continuing to write as, you know, I wait to see him pop up in the, <laughs> to say, you know, Michael Cooper is now editing this document. Um, you know, however many days I've got to try and finish up little things uh, before he starts reading. Uh, that's not happening this time around. And so this is really something I hope to continue doing because we really have a tight timeline on this on this five book series that they'll be written and done by June so that we can do more of a rapid release on them through the rest of the year. And in order to make that happen, I have to write really consistently. So that's good news. Um, I am at 44,577 words for the month of January and for the year. Um, and that's good stuff. I'm, re I'm really excited about tracking these stats monthly, you know, daily, monthly, figuring out what kind of when, how my best writing times fall out, if there is a pattern to that. And then I tend to unconsciously want to do better any given day or week than I did, you know, the, the one that came before. So it's kind of this unconscious way of pushing myself to keep writing more and more as we go on. Um, you know, if I can get into a place where I'm averaging 60,000 words a month, that would be awesome. I would, I would love to get that figured out. So that's good news. Getting the work done consistently now that, you know, our daughter is going to be nine months old very soon was something that was stressing me out a lot. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do that. And I wanted to push ahead with it. And so far it's working out. So uh, knock on wood. Uh, otherwise, uh, so this week I, I listened to, I kind of switched back and forth between reading and listening, but I finished Blackfish City by Sam Miller. And I'm still not quite sure how I feel about the book. You know, I think I would recommend it to anyone who is, wants to be aware of a highly recommended book from 2018 that probably will be recommended for a Hugo uh, and a probably, I think it, it already has been recommended for a Nebula. Or we're still in the, the reading phase for the recommendations, but it'll be probably nominated. I have a number of thoughts about the book. Uh, I think that if you hadn't read other books that were kind of doing the same thing, you would probably, would lead you to enjoy the book more. Um, for me, it it makes me think back to like my most recent book, Vesta Burning, where I was really trying to have a, a, bright, a broad scope of a story within less than 80,000 words. And that's that's a challenge. So, you know, Blackfish City, I think I want to say is right around 75, 80,000 words. It's got, uh, I want to say five POV characters when it starts. And then it also does, uses this technique where you've got kind of this floating info dump thing happening that's like a podcast that, you know, Miller moves to that uh, as kind of a break between chapters, which, reminded me a lot of kind of the way John Dos Passos in the USA trilogy would throw out newspaper articles or voices, you know, of people talking in New York to give you an idea of what New York was like. You know, you get other people's voices interjected into the story. Studs Terkel did that a lot too. Uh, I'm trying to think of fiction that has, has done that, but basically, you know, you move from the, you move from the third person, you know, kind of close third person, and then you get this broad perspective on, on, basically world building. And it does come about that that uh, has been created by a character because it's sort of this, you know, central mystery in the story as to who is doing this. The explanation for that, I, I, 
I kind of reached a point where I just wanted more. Like that that technique sort of felt like info dumping at a point when we were getting more of those things when I really wanted the story to move forward. And going back to Vesta Burning, so I, I had four POVs in this book and I was showing uh, a space battle. You kind of had some intrigue that was setting up the scope of why the battle took place. And then you get to the ground where you've got characters on the ground actually in the battle. And so you're kind of moving between, you know, very close action scenes to people that are away from the action, giving us a broader view on what's happening. And I didn't get a lot of complaints about this, but some of the some of the feedback that stuck in my mind was, uh, you know, too many POVs and people, basically just too many POVs. And, and I'm not sure how I could have, you know, it gets to a matter of if you're trying to tell a big story, it's pretty difficult to do that in a tight book. You need to give yourself space to, to really breathe, I think. And that's something that I'm actually have been focused on in Lunar Crisis, where I have one, one main story, one main POV, one character that the reader can really grab onto and follow. And then any digressions away from that are definitely less, you know, I do want to make those characters still should have interesting little bits about them that make them stand out in the reader's mind, but they are not the main course. And that was something with, with Blackfish City that it was, it was kind of difficult to grab onto one character to really empathize with them. And then some of the characters did things that were just, you know, honestly terrible that I, you couldn't, you didn't really know if you were supposed to empathize with those characters or not. And then by the end of the book, the characters, the protagonist did some things to the character that ended up being the antagonist that to me were just downright, you know, beast, like just animal-like. And I've, I actually found myself sympathizing with the antagonist more than the, the main characters, which, and it was just very like small details that were kind of thrown in. And I was just feeling like if they had just, um, if Miller had just maybe done something differently there, I would feel different about the, uh, the main characters and I would like them more. So, so yeah, I think I mentioned The Scar before, which is another book by China Mieville about like a floating city that his details like just kind of feel more lived in. Like I think if I had to choose between the two books, I would recommend to read The Scar, which is a much denser book. He, he definitely gives himself a lot more room to develop this city. I mean, typically I love city books. Like I love books that like kind of focus on ancient cities or the idea of building a culture, you know, and, and how do the author chooses little details to, to really create this tapestry of a living place uh, and culture. That stuff is fascinating to me. And so I, I don't know why this one wasn't working. And I think it kind of comes down to characters. I just couldn't grab onto a character. And then because of that, I found myself not um, buying into the world building. But then, you know, looking at the reviews, other people loved the world building. So, you know, take it as you will. Uh, it's just, this is a book, you know, it's a science, it's an SF book that's like, uh, kind of near future dystopia and it definitely got the whole marketing push as far as like NPR focused on this book um Locust loved this book like it got all as much push as a science fiction book can get so when I see that kind of thing I, I want that sort of book to be like awesome you know I want it to be amazing and it's a little bit frustrating like I, I don't think that I'm a, a hugely critical reader in that sense um but I don't know. I finished it. You know, I pushed through and finished it, which I have because I have so little time these days. I definitely will just not finish a book if it's absolutely not clicking for me. Um, but something that really did highlight for me how much of kind of a how much work <laughs> Blackfish City became. Um, I moved from Blackfish City to AI Superpowers by Kai Fu Lee, which is a nonfiction book that I have been wanting to read for a while. And um, Got the audio book on that, started listening to it, I want to say, uh, just a couple days ago. And I just want, I want to listen to this thing straight through. Like, it's just an amazing, it's an awesome story. It's, even though it's nonfiction, uh, Kai Fu Lee inserts himself into this, you know, the story of AI in China and gives some really, like, I've just kind of gotten through the, the last 15 years of just app development and technology development in China. And it's, it's pretty fascinating stuff. Like, it really, once is opening the door and a lot of things that I've I've also been checking into and and reading about China like there's a, or just watching there's a ton of documentaries on YouTube about Shenzhen um, you know with what's happening there as far as you know incubators and uh, the maker culture that the government is actively trying to uh, encourage and how that ties into venture capital um, and now Kai Fu Li is basically 
also just pulling all that together as far as data, you know, how much data China is making available to itself um, while simultaneously kind of walling off their internet and their systems and their data from the West. And so we will end up with these very different, I shouldn't say very different, but different philosophies about how individuals interact with technology, like what privacy means, because you know, there, there are demonstrations you can look at on YouTube where Chinese citizens, are, they are living in the future as far as what they can do with their phones, um, person-to-person economies, uh, opportunities that are being created within these apps that they have that are singular marketplaces. You know, they, they have Facebook within WeChat that does, you know, it combines multiple apps into one, basically one place that provides this ecosystem as a driver for their economy. And as I'm saying this, I'm feeling like you're really looking at this through rose-tinted glasses, but it is interesting because it's it's generating, you know, massive amounts of capital. And then, at least in my state, you know, the um, in Oregon, you know, we're, we sell a lot of timber to, uh, to Asia, and we're seeing a lot of investment coming back to... Um, to Oregon, Washington, California, where, you know, real estate is being bought up, companies are being bought up. And so in the next five, 10 years, like what's this going to look like as far as Chinese companies bringing these, um, these apps and services to the United States? And we don't have anything that can compete with it necessarily that I'm, that I'm seeing now, at least in the way that this book is presenting it. So it's kind of opening the door on just a lot of stuff that I was generally aware of, but it's really, um, really showing a, a much bigger picture than I was aware of. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to finish this book and then probably find more uh, information about it. You know, I've been doing a lot of reading about AI development in general. So a lot of that stuff is not new to me, but I would say that the practical, even tactical application of this technology is fascinating. You know, how companies are fi- vying against each other. You know, it's basically like the PC wars in the 80s um, here in the States, but now it's, it happens in China with apps. And, um, one of the things that, uh, Lee brings up is the fact that the United States has been really good at having specific, uh, knowledge based on individuals, but you reach a point with a technology where you don't like, you get to like 99% of the technology and you don't need the Einstein anymore, right? Like most, most people that can do that technology or do that work, now it's time to proliferate and find all the things you can do with that work. And so you don't need Einstein anymore. Um, now you need 100 people to go figure out what to do with the theory of relativity, and they're going to go find ways to make money. Because that's the other thing is that they're very focused on how they can capitalize on these ideas. So, so yeah, I would say uh, I would highly recommend this book right now. I'm, I'm only a good you know third of the way through it so far, but it's been a really fast read. It's enjoyable. Um, and... It's one of those where I've got the audiobook and I'm listening to it, but I am definitely going to buy the print so I can go back because there's definitely sections I want to highlight and uh, refer back to in the future because it's all it's all interconnected right now um, from some of the other books I've mentioned, uh, like Future of Violence and um, uh, Revolt of the Public, you know, and how these things are going to interconnect, I think is is pretty fascinating. Um, other stuff that happened this week, we recorded a sentence to paragraph podcast, which was a lot of fun. And I bought a Paperwhite, a 32 gig model. Um, I already had a Voyager, which I had gotten off eBay that's got, you know, the, the ad free with the cellular and all that. And it's, it's awesome. Um, it was like 150 for the, I want to say it's a 2016 model. Um, this one, I got this crazy deal where it was on sale and then American Express had a, or no, it was like a trade-in deal. I think I ended up getting, so I got the 32 gig model with special uh, offers, you know, the advertising, and it ended up costing, I want to say $60. So it was like 50% off for, for the Kindle or for the paperweight. And it's really nice. I would say it's as nice as the Voyager. So the Voyager was the premium, you know, Kindle. Um, this it's shaped differently and it's got some, not quite, you know, some of the, like the page turning features and whatnot that the Voyager has, but it's still a, a very nice reader. And the fact that it's, waterproof and whatnot. Um, I have to trade in my old, like I had a, I want to say it's like a sixth generation paper white or, or, or whatever. And that thing was bulletproof. Like one thing I did love about that is that the, the battery tends to die 
on the Voyager a lot faster if I don't put it in airplane mode. And the Paperwhite, I could completely forget about it and then go pick it up, you know, a month later. And still, it still has juice, still could read on it. And with the baby, I have been reading at night in the dark uh, more than I typically would. I, I tend to read paper if I, you know, if I'm going to read something, but with the baby and with reading, you know, whenever I can grab time to read, I am reading on the Kindle um, more, you know, more and more. So um, this thing's a, a winner. I think if you can get a good deal on them, um, it's a really nice reader. Um, and uh, I'm excited to use it more. I don't know which I'm going to end up using more, the, the Voyager or the Paperwhite, but um, it's still, you know, I like to see what my work looks like on it. Um, and so it's kind of, a, that's why I get them most of the time. And then I, I do read on them as well. Uh, we're still struggling with baby not sleeping um, as much as we would like. She tends to sleep from like 6 until 10.30 or 11. And then she's awake until 1 and then goes to sleep again. Um, so depending on how that's gone, my writing time has been um, from maybe 10 o'clock until midnight or 1 o'clock, uh, depending on which one of us is switching off to try and get her to go back to sleep. So that's been a challenge, and I just am generally kind of tired. <laughs> I don't know, I had been like feeling like I didn't need as much sleep, and that has not been the case um, these last few days. Uh, and then work has been very busy as well, So, uh, but still getting the, the writing done. Like I've said before, streaks work. I highly recommend it. Come up with a task that you do every day, like getting words down or uh, taking your vitamins or getting some exercise, and just make sure you do it every day. And I think you will see some results. Okay, so the one the one thing, you know, it's always funny. As I, as I talk about a topic or think about it, I find as soon as I'm done, the next week uh, I keep coming up with other things that I wish I had said. And on the subject of dinosaur authors, I think one thing that relates to all of this, like why I think people often feel like really resistant to change or frustration with change if they think they understand the way that publishing or being an author or any of this stuff works. You know, for me, book design, um, I think it all comes back to sunk cost fallacy. Um, if you've invested a lot of time in learning to do something, there's... There's a level of expertise associated with that, personal worth associated with that, having uh, personal knowledge and being an authority on something. Those are all things that help validate someone, um, especially if, you know, I, I even see folks that had publishing contracts um, and then for whatever reason either lost the contract or their the work reverted back to them and now they're trying to function in the indie world and uh, they just... They're having a hard time wrapping their minds around how things have changed. And I think sunk, sunk cost plays into that a lot. And so the idea of sunk cost, you know, is that we assign more value to things that we have invested time or money into when those things might not actually be serving us in the future and they're holding us back. So, you know, if you went to college to get a degree in book design, like I spent a lot of time learning to, to design newspapers and magazines, and now we're in a time where e-readers are the primary way that most people read. And an e-reader doesn't care about formatting because one of the cool things about e-readers is you can change, you know, the, the font, the format, the size of the text, all these things. Um, all that stuff you learned about book formatting doesn't matter. <laughs> and, and even readers, you know, getting paperbacks don't really care that as much as you think they do. Um, of course, it's really, you know, it's nice if someone appreciates that kind of thing, but most of your reading public, like, what do they care about? And so I think that's where this, this uh, resistance to change can come from, because that's when I was, I was important when I knew how to do that, right? And now you're saying that that thing that I knew how to do, which made me valuable, is no longer valuable. And, and if I change, I have to accept the fact that I'm not as valuable as I once was, you know, and yeah, you are valuable. You have skills, you know how to change, you've got institutional knowledge about a lot of different things. You know, being an author, certain things have not changed. You know, connecting with audiences, telling a story, um, you know, craft, those things don't change. It's just the vehicle that we're using to reach readers has changed. And so adjusting your thoughts to, adjusting the knowledge that you have to meet these new challenges is what's going to take 
you know, that dinosaur knowledge and turn it into mammal knowledge as you transition. Um, so that was something I wanted to, I wanted to say, you know, I, and I was just, I've been thinking about all week because I really didn't want to be overly negative about the idea of a dinosaur author. I mean, I think when someone's acting like a dinosaur, it's when they have given up on the idea of learning. And I've met people in their 90s that are still get up every day hoping they're going to learn something new. And those are the people to me that are really exciting to be around. And I've also, I work for a university. I've also met people in their 20s who it seems like they have the same mentality and they're just exhausting. So, you know, think about why you might be hanging on to certain ideas that might be holding you back. And what is the core, um, what is the core thing you're trying to accomplish? If it's connect with readers and tell a story, then if if the vehicle that you use to do that changes, well, we got to roll with it because, you know, like I mentioned in the last episode, the only constant is change. And so that gets into the changing science fiction market, and I am really trying to wrap my mind around a lot of things around around this. You know, I've I've been following following publishing for a long time. Uh, I mentioned in the last episode that I had like was part of a group running a small press from 2000 and 2008. We started online and then moved into, you know, selling through Amazon and small bookstores doing, we did like offset printing, small print runs and things like that. Um, I had studied a lot about what it took to run a small publishing company um, and what were the pros and cons of that. And, you know, I wanted to be the next small beer press, basically. Um, we took a different path and, I ended up doing something entirely different, but I learned a lot. And one of the things that, you know, as I, as I looking at things as a publisher and acquiring books that you think you can sell within, you know, the markets that you sell things. Um, when I came back in 2013 and joined a local writing group, that group was really focused on the traditional path. Like no one was even thinking about indie publishing or, I mean, a couple of people mentioned it, but the rest of the group really looked down on it and didn't see it as viable. And in 2013, like there are plenty of people that were making millions um, in indie publishing. And part of part of the problem with that is that all most of those sales are through Amazon, and the ways that we have to track those sales, people, you know, are constantly sort of poking holes in them. So there's a uh, Data guy who his name has come out. I've I didn't look it up. Sorry, you can you can Google data guy and find out what his name is. But he sells his services to publishers and whatnot. But he basically scrapes Amazon and has models that he uses to compare writers and sales and things like that. And can and can figure out like comparing indie authors with traditional publishers to basically do the book scan of Amazon to see like how much money is being made on Amazon. But Amazon is not sharing that information. So a lot of people will uh, discount that information uh, or say it's not valid, but it's kind of the best model we have right now. But we're in this time where indie publishing is rapidly, at least in the ebook side, is rapidly becoming the lion's share of what science fiction readers you know, engage with, um, which is really interesting to me. And if you look on the print side, you know, going through bookstores and magazines and things of that nature, it's still traditional publishing. So if you have people that have bought into the, the Kindle, um, the, the Amazon ecosystem, um, there are some traditional books that are in Kindle Unlimited, but not a lot of them. And so we've got this kind of divide between um, these two uh, these these two groups of writers, um, there's some crossover, but um, the traditional side is a side that is still getting all the attention when it comes to awards, um, the funnel of magazines going to publishers, going to, you know, movie deals and things like that. Um, but I think that's all changing really rapidly. And something that jumped out at me, which I thought was really interesting, uh, the latest episode of the Cood Street podcast with Gary Wolf and Jonathan Strayan, who I think I've mentioned them before. They're, uh, Gary Wolf, at least, is a science fiction historian, and Jonathan Strayan is a, uh, an editor. 
They both write for Locus magazine. And they were talking about the Philip K. Dick Award and the requirements for that award, which that basically was brought about to focus on uh, quality paperback fiction. And I, the award, I want to say, started in like 1981 or something. And they were talking about how it's actually become harder to, like, a lot of books, um, depending on who's publishing it, like there might not be a, a paperback edition. Or if there is a hardback edition, there's definitely going to, if there is a paperback edition, there's going to be a hardback edition. Like there aren't a lot of publishers that are just doing paperback. And what I was, and they didn't mention this when they were talking about it, but I was the whole time I'm thinking that's because paperback has become ebook. Like ebook has become the new um, mass market. More people are reading it. Um, that's where if you've got people that are like reading three and four books a week, all that's happening in ebooks. All that is happening on Amazon. And why isn't that being recognized? <laughs> that's what really surprises me. And I, and I think sometimes there's like some fear there as far as how do we identify, um, how do I identify, you know, just come right down to it, like the quality work or the work that's um, should be recognized as part of the science fiction field, which these other gatekeepers are so kind of um, invested in maintaining. And there's going to be a point, I think, pretty soon when that gap will be bridged. And if we're, you know, as Michael Cooper likes to say, the only arbiter is sales. If we're going to say it's sales, uh, if we're going to say it's awards, um, if readers are going to start gravitating towards certain authors that tend to be indie as opposed to being trad, um, that's when we're really going to start seeing the change. And I'm really curious how that's going to play out. You know, one of the things that I've been looking at when I kind of research books is what I would consider a mid-list trad book and, and an indie book. And how do the reviews play out? You know, because a trad book was selected by an editor. Um, the editor has obviously an idea of what they think is going to sell. So that's how they, you know, they look at the various books that are offered by agents or whatever, and they choose the one they think will sell. So basically that trad book is being put on the market having gone through the gate of the editor. Whereas a successful indie book has the only gate that book has gone through is the readers. Um, and so there are some anomalies. It's hard to compare apples to apples on this, but a lot of the books I've been looking at, at least as far as sales rankings go, the indie books will be will have higher review ratings than the trad books when it come when you compare like specific categories in science fiction, um, and that's really interesting. Like I, and I, it's so difficult to compare sales because you know most trad books are are not exclusive to Amazon, so their sales on Amazon are going to be lower because they're also available through you know Barnes and Noble and Kobo and all this stuff like everywhere, which changes you know the sales. Um, kind of how the sales are tracked. But I'm gonna, I am gonna. I think we're gonna see more and more of that converging over time, or that might become more, um, you know, if editors are seen as, why are we breaking from what the readers want when the readers are choosing what they want on Amazon? Um, especially as it becomes more and more undeniable that authors are doing very well on Amazon and then moving out of Amazon into Barnes and Noble and Kobo and whatever and continuing to grow their incomes by moving directly to readers. And the reader choice also kind of directs what the writers write, you know? So um, it's one thing if an editor has an idea of what they want to publish and if that's not what the readers want, um, you know, that book isn't going to do as well. So it's just really interesting to me how that is kind of playing out. And that's something I want to study more of. So that's just some overview stuff that I've, I've been thinking about. So if you were needing to make this decision now, I think there are a couple things to, to consider. You know, where are you in your career? Um, when I came back to writing in 2013, I was uh, 39. I was in a place where I was, I had been, I'd, you know, I've been published since I was 16 years old, if not younger. So I was really focused on publishing. I wanted to find a way to create income from what I was doing. Um, because at the time I didn't have the greatest job and I was 
excited about potentially doing something to be a full-time writer. I mean, my life situation has kind of changed and I've got a really great job right now. So I, I kind of gives me more time to, um, you know, develop a backlist, but it hasn't changed my focus. Like I'm, I'm still really bought into this model of indie publishing that I have. I'm just building a backlist across at least the next five years. Um, but what I was looking at with the people that were in my writing group was basically the the model was, you know, write a short story, take it to the group, the group critiques it. Um, I use that feedback to, you know, edit the story, submit the story to a magazine, and then basically cycle through and just do that. So I've constantly got stories out there with magazines. And we don't think about it a lot, but when you're submitting to magazines and you start interacting with editors in a consistent way, that is a form of networking. And I've talked with editors and they do recognize names um, if they're seeing them consistently and they start to root for certain authors because if you're getting close, like you kind of go through phases where you're getting, you get rejected immediately and then they start holding on to the story longer. They say they've passed it on to another editor. Then you start getting rejected based on just the story didn't fit with that issue or the story wasn't quite the story they were looking for. Um, and so uh, that's a good place to be because when you're there and you're consistent about writing and submitting stories, the editors know who, who you are. And then, you know, eventually you're going to get, they will buy a story. You know, if you're, if you're focused on writing the kind of story that, you know, the magazine wants, like Asimov's wants a certain kind of story, Analog wants a certain kind of story, you know, same thing, which is different than Uncanny. Um, or beneath seas of skies, things like that. So if you're being, if you're consistent, if you are, you know, really trying to hit that market, you're you're going to get there if you're writing at that level. So then you start publishing stories. You know that once you once the stories are published in a CEFWA qualifying market, um, you can get into the Science Fiction Writers of America. So now you have access to institutional knowledge through all these writers that are sharing information. So that's kind of like getting access to the club there. Um, I was really fortunate where the writers group I was in was kind of like a mini Cephla. We had folks that, you know, had been writing for 40 years. Um, so a ton of information. I learned so much from that group. And then uh, once I got into Cephla, I actually kind of felt like there wasn't a lot of additional stuff for me to learn because I had already been lucky enough to interact with people that had gone to Clarion and had gone to Odyssey and all these other, you know, been writing for years and could talk about the ups and downs of all of that. Um, but that's kind of how that process works. And then once you're you're publishing in the magazines, okay, now I've got credits to my name as a as an author. And now I start approaching agents. Um, you know, just recently there have been some stories that came out with have come out with agents, which kind of point out where they may or may not be the best choice for you. Um, but going from an agent to then uh, a publisher, um, you know, and getting a book deal. Um, but just getting a book deal is is not any kind of guarantee that you are going to make the money that will allow you to quit your job and be a writer full time. <laughs> you know, you'll you get a book deal. It could be a series deal, um, whatever. And depending on what that deal is, uh, you know, it could be as little as six thousand dollars. You know, for that year. Like if depending on what your advance is, and if you don't pay it out, um, it it might not be as great as you thought it would be. You know, getting an agent, getting selling a story is amazing. It's a great accomplishment. Getting an agent is a great accomplishment. The book deal, um, but the monetary side of it is something that because there's such a process of, you know, thousands of people are applying and only a few people get chosen, the act of being chosen um, tends to overshadow the monetary side of it and like what you might actually need to survive. And, um, I've got mentors that basically admit that they, they cannot depend on their, their their sales to support them. So they have other ways to do that. And that's kind of how that traditional model works, you know. But the upside of the traditional model is that while you're not, you might not get paid, um, you do get like the discoverability piece. Like your name is broadcast out, you know thousands of copies of a magazine. Uh, once that book comes out, like, you know, if Tor publishes you and you're on Tor.com, like that's huge exposure. Um, now you're automatically in that pipeline for the, you know, Hugo's and Nebula's and people are talking about the book and podcasters will talk about the book. Um, you know, all these things like that, that PR pipeline is going to get your name out there 
exponentially more than it would indie publishing. <laughs> um, now that doesn't happen for everybody, but if it does, there's a much higher likelihood of your, you know, your signal broadcast being so much higher. And the one thing to remember in this game is that discoverability is, you know, is the challenge. If you're, if you're doing it through the traditional route, you might not be getting paid, but your name is being known, and there's the cachet of the publisher, of whatever publisher you're working with, you know, and whatever reputation they have um, is assisting you as well. So, the indie side of it, uh, a lot of people might think that, okay, I've tried, I've tried getting published, that hasn't worked out. I'll just put it on Amazon, and and boom, it'll be done. <clears throat> well, it's it's important to really focus on indie publishing. You are not just writing, you know, an author. Um, you're a publisher who is creating a product and putting it on Amazon for sale. And I don't want to get into this too much because I talked about it in the last episode. Um, how Amazon is basically a database that you can search to see what is selling and use that to make choices about what you want to write, um, which is a resource that you know individuals did not have even ten years ago. Um, but as on the indie side, you know, you're networking. You still have to do a lot of the same things that you'd be doing. You're just on, on the trad side, but you're doing it in different ways. So you still have to network. You know, you want to reach out to other authors. You want to look at, you know, study Amazon and see what's working or not working. Figure out how Amazon works. When you come to other authors and potentially ask questions, you know, ha do your homework. So you're not wasting their time with, uh, with basic questions and things like that. Um, seeking out you know, providing value to Facebook groups or other authors or, or in whatever way you can do it so that, you know, you give generously of yourself so that when it's time for you to ask for assistance, whether it's, you know, newsletter swaps or assistance with beta reading or things like that, um, you're in a, they're much more likely to help you if you have potentially, in whatever way you could, helped people. Um, you know, one thing that new writers don't realize a lot is that if there's an author you admire that you want to connect with, an indie author, they most likely have a Facebook group, and one of the difficult things about being an author is keeping a Facebook group alive, right? Because it's like a garden. You want to, you know, give it little, give it seeds, give it water, it grows, hopefully people interact. Well, if you interact in a writer's Facebook group or whatever social media they have, that is helping them out because you're, you're basically kind of getting other people to interact when you do. And an author will appreciate that. You know, I mean, depending on where they are, I mean, you can have somebody who's selling like crazy and still doesn't have an active Facebook group. So that can be a great way to catch or to provide value to someone when you don't necessarily have anything to offer them, but even just posting consistently or interacting with their posts or starting conversations um, can have a lot of value for, for someone. So on the indie side, that's, that's a way to get started as well. You know, and if, if you're working, um, you know, you're writing, maybe you're in a place where you're not part of a writer's group or... Um, you have work that you want to get feedback on, that can be a way to start, you know, or even start building out your own beta reader group. Um, <clears throat> and that's something you could do through an author group as well. Like once you kind of get, you know, prove your, like demonstrate that you're a, an okay person who isn't, you know, a crazy person in a Facebook group, you could ask the author like, hey, I'm a writer as well. Do you mind if I maybe ask your members if there's anybody who would be interested in reading my work? And then that's really a really great way to get feedback that is the the kind of feedback you want so if it's a writer who is doing the kind of work that you want to write as well they're getting like feedback from their group is gold that's the audience that you want to reach you know this is not random feedback from random people in a writer's group um, these are the people that are buying books so um, so that can be a great resource there and so that networking starts to spread out and then one of the things that's really popular right now is like the co-authoring which is something that I that I do as well so as authors develop intellectual properties, their own series, their own universes, they are actively looking for authors to work with them. And depending on what your goals are, um, that can be a great way to, you know, A, get some income, uh, start developing workflow. I mean, um, really figuring out if you can do this at the level that it takes to be successful on Amazon. Um, that's a great way to learn all those things. And there are writers that are actively looking for folks to co-author with them as long as they can, you know, prove you can, you can do it. Um, so, so that's the kind of networking you want to do on the trad side. So what I'm trying to get at here is comparing these, these two different channels, um, 
they're, they both have work associated with them, right? So, so don't think that one or the other is easy. Um, they both have their, their challenges and they both have specific things to learn about each of them and ways to network and um, ways to approach it to prove that you're serious and you're a professional. Um, and I would even say that in today's market, like you don't wanna write off one or the other. Like you, it's always a little bit naive to me when someone says, well, I'm just focused on traditional publishing right now. Well, I'm a writer. I'm going to write more than one book in my life, right? So maybe the book that I'm trying, that I'm focused on trying to sell to the traditional side, we all know that takes a long time. So on the indie side, I could be writing a series in six months that will generate income for me. And I'm also learning all these other things about developing, you know, my goal was never to sell those books to the indie side or to the trad side. So I don't need to worry about, you know, first print rights and, and those kind of things. But I'm still learning as I do that. Um, <clears throat> so I think that, you know, the model going forward, it really is that, that hybrid model. And then, you know, as Michael Sullivan says, you kind of reach a point where if you're successful enough on the indie side, there isn't a lot the trad side can do for you. You know, he's reached a point where publishing through a traditional house does not broadcast his signal any more than he can do himself. So he has nothing to gain from working with a traditional publisher. You know, he is on that same level. Um, and so those are all things to, you know, think about as you as you balance projects back and forth. Um, another, if, if this is something you're really thinking about, like balancing traditional versus um, indie, Rachel Heron is a writer who primarily does um, memoir and thriller and romance. But she has a podcast called How Do You Write? And if you if you look that up, and she has both traditional deals and indie deals. And so she talks about that transition between the two channels quite a bit. Um, so those are things to things to think about and how those how these two different models play against each other. And as time goes on, how it will continue to overlap because traditional isn't going to be able to shut out the people who have previously indie published um, and the, and the folks that are making a lot of money indie are, are going to be making hard decisions about whether trad is worth it to them. And so trad is really going to have to up their value, you know, raise their value proposition to writers that are already being successful. Um, you know, Cause obviously a traditional publisher is there to make money. So are they, are they going to make even more money? Um, are they going to get you those, uh, you know, movie, de you know, assist with movie deals and uh, licensing and that other stuff that maybe you can't do on your own or aren't knowledgeable about. And are they the right way to go to help with that? You know, foreign, foreign rights, things like that. So when we think about for science fiction, you know, for me, as I think about these two channels that are separate right now, and I often feel that like, I know what the, I know what the traditional reader kind of expects and what they've, what they're being sort of led to expect by editors. And then the indie side is really being directed by readers and a certain kind of reader. Um, I really wonder how, if they're going to end up separating. You know, one like military science fiction is really, you know, the dominant uh, subgenre right now in science fiction on Kindle. And a lot of reasons you could point to that. You know, they're adventure focused. It's pure entertainment. Um, the zeitgeist maybe right now. People want an easy an easy read that. Uh, the good guy wins out over the bad guy, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that's going to that's gonna continue to segment. And as more people are drawn into that, what sort of stories are they going to expect? And we're going to have stories that and books that come out of the indie side that will, will, earn, you know, will win awards and will um, win the respect of that old guard gatekeeping side. And people won't be able to deny that quality work is coming out of uh, indie publishing. Um, it's going to happen eventually. You know, the model, I think it's easy to poo-poo the model because the audience wants books so much faster than the traditional side. But the whole argument about fast not being quality um, can be argued both ways, you know, and there's going to be a great book that will have been written quickly or whatever that's going to, you know, blow it out of the water. And then these things will just continue to change over time. Um, and fandom will shift. I think the challenge, as always, is discoverability. And like I was talking about, the trad offers great discoverability. We'll get new ways on the indie side to drive discoverability. If it's not Amazon itself, then we're going to get other 
you know, that's what it's going to be what it's all about is how to how to discover that work. Um, because you'll always have the, that's the thing about self-publishing. There's no, there's no obstacle there to publishing. So you've got your base level of anybody that can publish. And there are millions of books like that. And then the books that start to rise out of that, that either get a leg up by working with an existing author or publishing group or whatever that's indie focused. Um, and then, you know, you have different tiers of even indie publishing. And that's something that Michael Sullivan talked about in his post. And so eventually, you know, magazines like Locus that report on the quote unquote industry uh, will start paying more attention. But I'm just, I'm really curious about when that is, when that bleed through is going to happen. So I touched on, you know, what's right for you. And like I said, both, um, both have their pros and their cons. I would say if you're early in your career, you have more time to really write those short stories, hone your ability to tell a great story, um, really start drilling down on the kind of audience you want to reach. And I've had conversations with folks that, you know, were writing short stories and getting in magazines and they didn't want to hear about making money. Like that's not what was interesting to them. I would like to do both. You know, I want to write great books that are also commercially viable. Um, but depending on where you are, it kind of depends on how much time you have. But I would also say that don't let that be an obstacle. If your goal is to get into magazines or, or whatever, like there's never been a better time to do that. You know, it, it doesn't cost you anything to submit. Um, the main thing I've always heard from editors is that read the magazine. You know, if you, daily science fiction is a great market because they, they publish a lot of stories. Um, you can submit digitally, but they have guidelines. They don't want long stories or um, they don't want grim dark or military science fiction. They want a certain kind of story. And one of the things that I've heard editors say is because it's so, you know, you don't have to pay for postage or anything anymore to submit. They just get so much weird stuff that that wastes their time. So be respectful of their guidelines, of their time. Um, and like I said, as they start to recognize your name, you find yourself floating up to the top of the slush pile. Um, and it, and it will happen, you know, it it might take a couple years, but it happens (laughs) and, you know, interact with people, talk to writers, talk to editors, go to conferences, let people know what your intention is. You know, one of the things that I always give people this advice in general, like whatever you want out of life, decide what it is and then tell people about it. Um, I'm not a huge woo woo. The universe will give you what you want kind of person, but If you don't tell people what you want, they're not going to help you get it. (laughs) And and oftentimes people do want to help you get it. You know, editors want to find new writers. There's nothing they love more than discovering a new writer uh, because that's validating for them. They want to be the person that discovered the hot new science fiction writer. You know, that's cool for them. Um, If your goal is to, and I I don't want to say that you can't write great fiction, you know, be focused on writing great fiction and go indie because it's, um, you can absolutely do that. Like that's my, I want to write great stuff. I definitely have a focus on craft and telling the best stories I can tell, but I also try and write them as fast as I can. (laughs) And I don't have a year to futz around with one book, you know, so that's kind of a different mindset there. Um, so those are things to, you know, to think about. Like if, if an opportunity falls in your lap to write something with an experienced indie author, I would take that because that, that person is, knows the market is if they're being successful and they're, they're selling a lot of books and they have an audience. Um, that's an opportunity for you to learn to do all those things. And even if you don't want to, you know, one of the things about this market now is if you didn't want to use your actual name, you can use a pen name and then you just get to write the story and not care. You know, your grandma's not going to know that it was you. Um, but that's a way to get great experience and, and learn the market, you know, the great thing is that you can learn the market and make some money. So that's, that's awesome. Um, the last thing I want to say about, you know, gatekeeping and tying back into dinosaurs is that it's, they're moving on. Like the people that have not embraced these new concepts, um, are not writing anymore in a lot of ways. And you might hear people giving their opinions about stuff, but if they're not your readers, then, or not readers of the genre that you were interested in selling in, you know, rate their opinion accordingly. Um, (laughs) Because if they if they can't it, and it always I think I said this last time that science fiction writers that don't want to embrace change just drive me nuts <laughs> because what else are we doing right if you're not excited about the future and excited about new ways to read stories and tell stories then um, I don't know what to tell you but uh, the one thing that's sad to me about the old guard you know potentially kind of moving on is that we're 
it sometimes feels like we're losing this deep knowledge of science fiction history and and we hear you know people will pop up on Amazon acting like science fantasy is like the hot new genre and I sometimes wonder like have you not heard of Gene Wolfe have you not heard of you know I mean books even from the 40s and 50s where uh there's been an interplay between science fiction and fantasy forever but that deep knowledge of sf history and that conversation that takes place where a new book can you know reference an older book or reflect on that older book um i find that stuff really fun and really interesting and it deepens my enjoyment of a book if it's doing something like that um currently i'm kind of only seeing that stuff in trad um but it would be really fun to see more of that in on the indie side and I think as we draw more readers from trad, there'll be more appreciation of that. Um, but it just it's just such a new, it's such a new channel. If we call it an industry, it's such a new industry that I think that's going to change over time as well. As it balances out, we have the new people that don't care about what came before. And, and all of this starts to balance and blend together. It's going to be really interesting. Uh, but I also think that's when all of these stories will be integrated into the the quote unquote field, you know, the the tapestry of what science fiction is um, as these things become compared. Because I see one of the things I see in indie publishing a lot is that I think there are a lot of influences that sometimes people will say that they didn't, they weren't influenced, but you know, it really seems like they were. If it wasn't through a movie or a previous book or you know a story that came before that was plainly influenced by a previous kind of book. I don't know. I'm going to see, I, I think we'll see more of that in the future. So like I said, there's always going to be new opportunities for indies and discoverability is the the challenge. So, so I hope that kind of, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to clarify right now because it's so muddy, but maybe that gives you an idea of what these two markets are like right now and how to approach them depending on what your goals are. So, and how much time you have, you know, maybe, maybe you're me and like, I want to be, you know, I want to publish a book in three years. So I don't have time to be submitting them to magazines and fight, you know, clawing my way up to the top of the editorial list. Right. So I looked for a different way. And right now indie publishing is, is that way. And I was very fortunate to have, you know, be able to develop the relationships that I, that I have. So I feel good about that. Goals for next week, continue the writing streak, writing at least 1,500 words, or at least 1,000 words, I should say. That's been pretty consistent. I do want to record some audio of Crash in Love, my novella. I said the same thing last week, and it didn't happen. So let's, uh, I'm, I'm going to figure that out. And then I also like to post one thing a day to my website, uh, just so I get some more consistency with that. Because right now, the podcast is the only thing that's on there, but I would like to be more consistent about sharing or you know whatever it is on the website so i've got more content there um so we'll see what happens with that thanks for listening and uh we'll see you next week until then happy writing mm-hmm.